for centuries, astronomers and mathematicians have gazed in awe and wonder at the heavens, seeking to discover if there's a master plan. From the finite to the infinite, from the smallest subatomic particles to the entirety of the universe in which we live, there is evidence of the work of a master mathematician. For many of our greatest natural philosophers, like Sir Isaac Newton, to study the mechanics of nature was to study the work of the Creator. There could be no difference between science and religion because there was only one truth. The universe and all the ways in which it works was an act of God, not some random act of chance. And at its heart was mathematics. bodies was created in a nuclear cauldron within a star millions of years ago. It's true to say that we are the children of the stars. We are all living beings. We are born, we exist, and then we die. But what makes our presence remarkable is our consciousness. We are aware of our own existence. Despite all our great scientific achievements, though, we cannot explain our own consciousness. In fact, the brain operates automatically. Its intricate processes seem to defy analysis. How does the brain receive, process, and store the enormous amounts of information it has to deal with? And how does the brain interpret this data into feelings, like sadness or joy? Just as it's used in examining the way the universe works, so mathematics is becoming a major tool in understanding how the brain functions. The consequences for mankind are staggering and will influence our whole appreciation of the power of mathematics and the understanding of our consciousness itself. Michael Barnsley is a world-renowned mathematician. His work has led him to gain a deep understanding of the relationship between mathematics and the brain, the human mind and its perception of the physical world. As we have tried over the centuries to describe precisely and accurately what things are to try to get to the bottom of things, so mathematics has emerged as our most exact, precise, logical description of the physical, observable universe. But even mathematics is limited in its power. There are things that mathematics cannot describe. And one of these things is consciousness. So, what do leading mathematicians and scientists already think about consciousness? We know very little about what kind of structures produce consciousness. We know that human brains do, but uh, what it is in a human brain that makes it conscious is something quite mysterious to us. There's a tremendous gap between any talk about neural networks, the firing of synapses, interesting and important though that is, and our simplest mental experiences of, say, feeling hungry or perceiving a patch of pink. And at the moment, we haven't the slightest idea of how to bridge that gap. Consciousness is not something which you can understand in terms of simply computational models. There's a prevalent view these days that computers, if they get to a certain level, would, would be conscious. I don't think that's right at all. I think there's something else involved. And the reason I believe this has to do with our understanding of mathematics. And the understanding of mathematics can be shown to be something which is simply not a purely computational activity. There's something else involved. We know an awful lot about when people are conscious and when they're not conscious. Uh, but I don't think there's any scientific explanation for the actual experience I have when, for example, I look at flowers and see colours, shapes that tickle my fancy. All those subjective aspects, I don't think there's any uh, scientific explanation for that. What Michael Barnsley has now discovered, though, is how to make computers actually see images in a way that mimics the human brain. Our brains produce images of far higher resolution than the signals recorded by our eyes. 
Barnsley's mathematics mimic our minds by capturing the fundamental patterns of nature. His work has already resulted in a radical approach to interpreting and delivering images with computers. His mathematics could revolutionize how we store, retrieve, and even how we fundamentally think about manipulating information electronically. Barnsley's discoveries in data compression technology cleverly define reality in mathematical terms, delivering pioneering theories and major practical applications. His work was used to compress the 7,000 plus color images in the CD-ROM Multimedia Encyclopedia in Carter. Michael Barnsley's fantastic voyage of discovery into mathematics will enhance not only the development of computers, but also our understanding of our consciousness. Maybe even bringing us one step closer to knowing the mind of the master mathematician. But how far can mathematics go now in helping us in our interpretation of reality and in our quest to make sense of our world? Let's look first at the nature of space. What is space made of? How do we describe this nothing stuff? Not the ferns, but the spaces between, where the air is and where it is not, these smaller and smaller bits of space between the fronds. It seems limitlessly vast and infinitely small. How do I connect this nothing, this empty space out here, this part of reality, with the inner space of my intuition, of my imagination, that place where the dreams occur, and one sees those things that are not of this world, but in the mind where abstract ideas happen. How do we think of this stuff? How do we connect it to the inner space of our minds? Well, the way I like to look at these issues is really in terms of three worlds and the three mysteries which connect the worlds. One of the worlds is the physical world, the world of physical objects like trees and so on. And there is a mystery about why it is that physical objects behave so precisely in accordance with mathematical laws. The more deeply we look into the behavior of things, the more we find that it's mathematics which governs the behavior of things, and the precision of that mathematics is absolutely extraordinary. This rock, what is it that I am touching? What is it made of? Atoms. And what are they made of? Mainly empty space with tiny electrons orbiting nuclei made of protons and neutrons. These things are both vibrant energy like light and simultaneously particles bound together by a mathematical equation called the Schrodinger equation. As we make more and more precise experiments to try and discover and say very precisely what matter is made of, we bump into the language of mathematics. Real things seem to become abstract concepts, seem to become the stuff of consciousness itself. Then there's the mystery of why it is that mentality arises when you have the right kinds of physical structure. Human brains are physical objects, yet they seem to evoke this third world, the mysterious mental world. And it's that mental world whereby we access the world of mathematical absolutes. There's a world that we explore through our conscious mathematical um, abilities, a world of already existing entities, I think, things like the Mandelbrot set, very complicated things that surely didn't come into existence when human beings first began to think about them, which have always been there in some sense, and we have access to it through our conscious powers of thinking, particular sort of thinking, of course, the precise thinking of mathematics. Some people might take the view that even those mathematical notions are things which emerge out of mentality. So we have, in a sense, a rather mysterious triangle, the triangle of how it is that the physical world seems almost to emerge out of the mathematical world, how it is that our mentality seems to emerge out of the physical world, and the third mystery, how is it is, how it is that the mathematical world almost seems to emerge out of our mentality. So here we have a kind of paradox, the three things, each one seeming to come from the one before. I like to present it in this way as a kind of additional mystery, if you like, just to emphasize that there is something deep there that we really don't understand. Maybe there's just one thing which has these different aspects to it. 
More than 2,000 years ago, the learned Greeks conceived that true reality was mathematical in nature. Euclidean geometry, expounded in the 4th century BC, provides a theory of the physics of space. It provides a very accurate description of the world in which we live. Euclid reasoned on figures drawn in the imagination or on papyrus. He began by thinking about statements so obvious and intuitive that no one would dispute them. They were called axioms. They were really obvious stuff. Statements like... Given two points, there is a line that joins them. A line can be prolonged indefinitely, endlessly, without limit. If you have a line and a point not on it, then there exists a line through the point that does not meet the first line, called a parallel line. Really obvious, right? And we can all agree on them. They provide the glue that holds our models of reality together, make a given model self-consistent and able to make predictions. Using these axioms, the ancient Greeks made an imagined, perfect mathematical space of points and lines. They imagined a plane, flat, a mirror smooth, a microscopically thin, endless, vast sheet going on forever and ever. This flat, abstract place is called the Euclidean plane. It is stretchable. We can shrink or expand it without limit. This magical plane made possible the introduction of the idea of measurement. Here is a simple measuring stick. Think of it as a line segment in the Euclidean plane. Then we can shrink the measuring stick to produce two smaller sticks, each one a half the length of the original. The measuring stick is made of two smaller copies of itself. Space is subdivided, yet still the same. We can picture this process repeated over and over. Using this device, we can express distances in the Euclidean plane. We have a way of giving addresses, that is coordinates, pairs of decimal numbers to points in the plane. This is the basis of measurement itself, the measurement of length, and indeed of most things that we can measure. What is exciting to me is how, in reading the scale on a measuring stick, we are able to make an objective connection between the outer reality and the Euclidean plane using the coarse, blurry, finite resolution window that is the eye. Using the Euclidean plane, we are able to make predictions about reality. Let us think for a moment about an obvious sort of prediction that we can make. Space is made of points. Where is a point in the real world? Euclidean geometry predicts that we can specify a point, a specific location, to infinite precision. Here is the satellite view of where I am standing. It gives my coordinates as longitude 84.43, latitude 30.95. Here we have zoomed in closer and closer still. Now you can see me. The point is right here where I'm standing. What are its coordinates now? Longitude, 84.43794. Latitude, 30.95692. But where exactly are we talking about? This point right here. We are zooming in closer and closer, dividing up space and specifying the point to greater and greater precision. But there are limits to the power of our instruments to magnify and observe the smallest particles in space. However, in the abstract world of the Euclidean plane, the mathematician can go on and on forever, specifying the exact position of a point with greater and greater accuracy. The reason why many of the things predicted by Euclidean geometry are logically true is profound. It is that little bits of space are like big bits of space if you magnify them up or move them around. Space is the same everywhere at all sizes. To capture this idea, we need the idea of a transformer. This is a new idea. It's not an electrical transformer. 
A transformer is a revolutionary concept in mathematics. It's a virtual entity. This means it can only exist in our minds. It's not real. We can't touch it. But its consequences in equations allows us to do amazing things. It can move objects around the Euclidean plane in very special ways. This transformer moves everything on which it acts closer and closer towards a fixed point, which doesn't move. At the same time, the transformer makes the object it's moving progressively smaller. This is the basic principle behind transformers. Transformers are very special and surprising. Here's a different transformer. Repeated application of this transformer causes the initial leaf to be rotated and shrunk along a spiral path, ending at the fixed point. This transformer deforms a butterfly's wing, turns it upside down, makes it smaller, and moves it. Repeated application of the transformer makes a beautiful pattern. Amazingly and stunningly, with only a few of these transformers, we are able to describe geometrical objects and make deep predictions about reality. Indeed, one point of view is that it is these transformers that form the basic geometrical elements, rather than the lines, triangles, and so on. Here's another example. Look at this line. Along comes a transformer. It shrinks the line, creating a new one. It's exactly the same as the original, except it's smaller. Now, this transformer makes another new line. We are going to discover something wonderful that we can do with these two transformers, the red one and the blue one. Now, what happens when we adjust these transformers? We get the original line out of the two small ones. It's the same as the two transforms of itself. Is this deep? Yes, this is what enabled our measuring stick to work. We can add up lengths. Note that one cannot actually see a line segment any more than one can see a distant star. But we can make synthetic pictures to examine and approximate ever closer to a line segment using instruments such as computer graphics devices. Geometrical objects are, in many ways, more certain than any star because of their timelessness, their precision, their universality, and our detailed knowledge of them. A very practical prediction about reality was Pythagoras' theorem. It is one of the great and timeless discoveries of those old Greeks. It will remain true 2,000 years in the future, regardless of our changing models of reality. It was built from the axioms using the glue of logic and reason. Let's see. Three units from this first point to here, and at right angles to it, four units to this tip. So how far is it from the first point to the tip? Well, our scientific prediction using Pythagoras' theorem is five units, because three squared plus four squared equals five squared. And our prediction is correct. How amazing. Well, the idea of using a model to make predictions that you then go along and test is the basis of science. Using Pythagoras' theorem and other predictions, the ancient Greeks validated their first science. They have succeeded in establishing a connection between the inner world of the imagination and the outer reality. We've grasped it. We have a model. This stuff out here, this emptiness, is described inside our heads. We have an inner space like the outer reality. We have sensed reality through the clumsy instruments of our vision and got it inside us. Our abstract inner ideas match our perceptions of reality. As it was perfectly logical, Euclidean geometry seemed to offer the perfect way of looking at the world in ancient times. However, as a deeper understanding of mathematics developed, Euclidean geometry proved not to be a perfect match to reality. Albert Einstein had another idea. Using very sophisticated measuring techniques, 
space was found to be gently curved. In fact, during a total eclipse of the sun in the First World War, scientists working together from nations actually at war proved Einstein's theory was correct. Here, the quest for universal truth transcended human failings. Today, we know that space is slightly warped. But such mismatches between physical reality and the Euclidean abstract reality do not make either place any less real. Way back, over 2,000 years ago, the Greeks thought that their geometry was the major key towards understanding the language of the universe. The Greeks presumably thought this was what geometry was. And if you like, the reason they thought that is because space, in fact, accords with this geometry to an extraordinarily precise degree. So the fact that they somehow thought this was the only geometry was related to the fact that they were trying to reveal something out there in three-dimensional space, um, which they realized did accord to this precise mathematical notion that they were developing. The Greeks were excited by the abstract place they had found. The Pythagoreans thought that the physical world was ordered according to pleasing mathematical relationships and developed a mystical view of reality. I think of Pythagoras as a wizard drawing pentagons in the sand and singing out the magical significance of numbers. He believed that all was mathematics, equation and number. How extraordinarily modern this idea has turned out to be. Most of modern physics validates this idea. When you try to pin down what reality is made of, it gets away from you. It more and more seems as if all material things and our very selves are made of mathematical stuff. Look at this computer graphics image. What is it made of? Actually, it's made of lots of little triangles with imaginary light bouncing off them. And the computer expresses all of this in numbers. Pythagoras would be leaping around with delight. The Greek philosopher Plato talked of the realm of the unchanging forms. He conceived the observable world as an imperfect image of a realm of unobservable and unchanging forms, eternal, changeless and incorporeal. He believed in the world of mathematical objects that lines and triangles are real, but perceived by the mind. It was one of the great things that Plato achieved was to realize the distinction between the mathematical idea of geometry, which was something out there in a sense, it's sort of absolute notions, and the physical world. Partly because Euclid's geometry was considered to be the only geometry no one bothered to question or examine many of its details. Towards the end of the 19th century, another view emerged, and Euclidean geometry is now regarded as one example of possible geometries. During the 20th century, mathematicians discovered many new denizens of the realm of unchanging forms. Many mathematical professor types started to see in the world of the imagination beautiful shapes and forms on the Euclidean plane. The first pictures of these objects started to appear in about 1980 on computer screens. So out of the imaginative minds of mathematicians came a brand new world, a virtual world based upon numbers and equations. But as a consequence, they also created a new art form something in the computer age that inspires us with feelings of extraordinary wonder. This leaf is actually a series of numbers. This is an amazing arabesque pattern. And this biological cell, numbers again. As is this graph, just like the ebb and flow of the stock market prices. This one looks like a galaxy. These amazing images are very diverse. Many of these new geometrical things have the property that when you magnify them up, they reveal more and more intricate detail, not boring old line segments. Look at this curve. As we zoom in on it, we see it remains wiggly and complicated. Now, many of these geometrical objects are the same as transforms of themselves. 
just like the line segment in the triangle. In 1978, Mandelbrot named these things fractals. But in 1982, a mathematician called John Hutchinson discovered something about triangles and lines that I don't think those old Greeks, or anyone else since for that matter, knew. What he discovered applies to these fractals as well. To explain what he discovered, get hold of your blue and red transformers. I start with a spider. First I apply the blue transformer to the spider to make this smaller spider here. Then I apply the red one to make this shrunken spider here. Then I add up the two transformed spiders to get the result. It's a spider monster! Now I again use the two transformers, this time on the spider monster. The result is another horrible thing, more like a millipede. Let's keep going. We arrive at the line segment. When it is transformed by the red and blue transformers, it doesn't change. Now what happens if instead of starting with the spider, we start with an elephant? Watch. As we repeatedly apply the two transformers, the elephant turns into the same line segment. What Hutchinson discovered was that if you have any set of transformers, you can always make one, and only one, geometrical object out of them. The blue one and the red one always make a line segment, exactly the same one. Other sets of transformers make other things, some ordinary, some extraordinary. Let's put this to the test. Here's a set of transformers. What picture will they make? It looks biological, and we can magnify it. Any set of transformers is a formula for a unique and possibly fantastic geometrical object. Here, transformers make a leafy pattern. What happens when we apply a yellow and green transformer to the spider? First, we apply them once. Look, a strange shape is emerging. Apply them again and again. Oh, oh, surprise, surprise, our friend the right angle triangle. Again, it makes no difference to the final picture, whatever we start from. Look at this galaxy fractal. It's made up of two transforms of itself. One transform moves the galaxy towards this point and also shrinks it. The other one does this. Now throw away the galaxy, but keep the two transformers. Now let's return to our spider and apply these two transformers. Again, shrink and rotate, shrink and rotate. Then add up the result. Repeat the process and we get back to the galaxy fractal. So a complex shape can be expressed simply with transformers. These can be applied to other shapes, such as flowers. Repeated application of the transformers reconstitutes the complex shape. We now have a powerful mechanism to represent extremely complicated things by simpler things. Think of the fantastic power this gives us in the virtual world. So what's the big deal? It's this. Any set of transformers make a unique, special, new geometrical object. The objects may look very complicated, but the transformers are all you need to describe them perfectly. One of the things that I discovered was that if upon looking at an object in the real world, you could see some transformed copies of the object inside the object so that it is covered up with the transformed copies, then you could use the transformers to make a mathematical model of the object, sort of lift it out of the real world and put it on the Euclidean plane in idealized form. Here's an example. Let's take a close look at this fern. It's not hard to see that there are four transformers which make it up. The whole is made of all of this top part, which looks like a shrunken fern. This frond on the lower left, this frond on the lower right, and stem. 
the stem is made by an extreme sort of transformer that shrinks all of space sideways. Now throw away the fern and keep the four transformers. What will appear when these transformers are repeatedly applied to this rectangle? After one application, we get four rectangles, one of which is very thin. After two applications of the transformers, we get this picture. And if we apply them again and again and again, we get this amazingly beautiful result. It's this almost magical mathematical fern that will live in the Euclidean plane forever and, of course, in our imaginations. So what conclusion can we draw from our experiment? The original fern equals this transform of the fern, plus this transform of the fern, plus this transform of the fern, and finally, plus this transform of the fern. This is a revolutionary way of representing objects and a mechanism for creating entirely new ones in the virtual world. It could also be how our brains construct reality inside our minds. The transformers in our brains interpret the raw input arriving from our senses to create the physical, observable universe, which we experience. The shapes, colors, textures, sounds and aromas, down to even the very basic, solid and separate appearance of things. That's the theory. But what can we do with this mathematics now? Knowing only these four transformers, this picture can be passed on to the future. I like to think of some old professor, 2,000 years from now, showing our construction of the fern. The real world will have changed, but the mathematics will not. But this mathematical fern and this real fern are both pictures of objects that belong in different realms, one called reality and the other called Euclidean geometry. They are different. The Euclidean one is cleaner and simpler. You will never know this specific exact real fern. Already it is fading and changing. But to the extent that you can know it, precisely, it will share in common with the abstract one that the language in which it must be described is a mathematical one. But there is much about the real fern that we can never know. Indeed, that is true even of the Euclidean fern, because mathematics always contain statements that we can neither prove nor disprove. Mathematics is incomplete, requiring more and more input from human minds to decide what is true and what is false. Our models of reality are always incomplete. Believe it or not, that's a theorem. Goodell's theorem. There was a, a view being put forward in, in the early part of this century that somehow all mathematical thinking could be phrased in terms of what are called formal systems. Roughly speaking, it means that you could remove the necessity of understanding from mathematics. You, you mechanize the entire thing. It's all a question of following rules. And what Gödel showed is that that's simply not true. Logical proof is a very limited category. Uh, most interesting things are things that we have reasons for believing in, but are not logical certainties. In fact, Kurt Gödel, who was the great logician of the 20th century, showed that you couldn't even prove the logical consistency of arithmetic. We are not simply machines following according to pre-assigned rules. There is something in our insight, in our consciousness, I would say, in our ability to understand things which enables us to transcend rules, no matter what those rules are. So, mastering mathematics is more than simply understanding a set of rules. It's also about applying our perceptions of reality to mathematical models in order to achieve specific aims. Let us discuss how mathematics can describe real pictures. I'm talking about the pictures that fill the field of vision as we look out on the real world. Think of one frozen in time, like a photograph, but in the mind's eye. How do we describe these colorful pictures? They are seemingly more complex than triangles and fern images. Real pictures are very special, very particular. 
They are very far from random. Real pictures are rich in details and textures. The bark on that tree, the coruscations on the cloud and the ripples on the water. How would you describe your vision to a person who had lived all of his life in a dark cave with no knowledge of the banks of trees, the sunlit rivers and the sky? What special properties do pictures have? Real pictures usually contain edges. Here is an edge of the tree line. Here's the edge of a sawtooth palmetto leaf. And here's the edge of the water. Pictures also contain smooth regions, like the clear sky, the white of a flat cloud, or still water. And lastly, there are textures, mud textures, lichen textures, tree textures. To precisely describe these edges, smooth regions and textures, imagine a picture on the Euclidean plane with all of its colours painted on it. It's stretchable, like the skin of a balloon. Suppose that our transformer can pick up a colourful copy of what is in a region of the picture and shrink and move the region. Any picture can be modelled with transformers like these. First an edge. Here, this edge of rock and sky. This transformer picks it up, transforms it and puts it back. We can make all of the edges like this. The edges are transforms of themselves. Now this smooth piece here, look at the blue so steady and bright. Using a transformer, let us take a part of the blue and shrink it down. It superimposes almost perfectly on part of the sky. The sky is made of transforms of itself. Look at this part of a rock. It is smooth too and looks like a special transform of itself. We use our special transformers to make copies of textures and then move them around in a real picture. The texture of this sand is transformed to this one, then to this one, and to this one. Look at this tree trunk. It's like this one, this one, and this one. And this petal is like this one, and this one. Putting all this together, Suppose that we have got the transformers for a butterfly picture. Then we can use them to make a mathematical picture. Imagine a magical photocopy machine. It works on colorful Euclidean plane substance instead of paper. Put any colorful picture on top, anyone you like. All of the transformers that we kept go to work on it. Each part of the transformed picture comes from somewhere in the one on top of the copier. Now take the picture that comes out of the copier and put it back on top. Then make a specially transformed copy of it. Then put that copy on top and make a copy of it. And again, and repeat, and repeat forever. The result, created on the colourful Euclidean plane, is a unique mathematical picture a model of the original from which we got the transformers. The final picture is always the same. It's described precisely, uniquely specified by the transformers and them alone. Like the right angle triangle, only this time it's a full colour picture that can be magnified endlessly. It belongs to the realm of unchanging forms. It is made by mimicking the functioning of our brains. What we have just done is make an intuitive description of a theorem. It enables us to make mathematical pictures whose relation to real pictures is analogous to the relation of the mathematical fern to a real fern. But when you actually examine a real photograph closely, you find it is made of printed dots or chemical emulsion. Indeed, it is not possible to capture pictures of the physical observable universe at infinite resolution. When we try to look very closely at reality, we can no longer see details because of the finite wavelength of light and the trembling of the atoms. Even if our pictures of reality are fuzzy, 
the human mind is still able to produce images of far higher resolution than those physically recorded by the retina. What are the factors that limit the resolution of the images sent from our eyes to our brains? There are three possible factors limiting the resolution of the eye. That is the quality of the image received at the back of the eye. One is that it's the quality of the image provided by the lens and the cornea. Uh, the other would be that there's actually, it's actually limited by the wave nature of light in the same way that a telescope, the resolution of a telescope is limited. And the third is that it might be limited by the separation and size of the photoreceptors which pick up the image. For example, if I see a person at, uh, far away in a field, I know it's a man, and I know he has two eyes. I can perhaps make out a vague uh, indication that he's not mutilated in some way. So I know he's got all the details uh, there. But I, and so I, I think I see him with two eyes and five fingers and so on, even though there's no way in which one could deduce that he has five fingers and two eyes from the actual details of the image. We are constantly filling in details from past experience to complete the incomplete evidence of our current experience. So what is a real physical picture? In the end, it is in the mind, for it is there that we see. We see the world one way, insects see it another, and artists in yet other ways. A bee can see ultraviolet, and flowers look very different to them. A dragonfly sees with a compound eye, like lots of little eyes, and the visions of artists are amazing. Is reality glowing light as Turner saw it? My point is this. In the end, our pictures of reality depend on our own consciousness. So what can we say precisely and carefully about that? We often think we see details in an image when in fact we're supplying these by, with our brain. For example, I look over there and I see a tree with lots of fine leaves on it. But when I look back, um, I still see the leaves, even though the quality of the image in the periphery of the field of vision is nowhere near good enough to enable me to see those leaves now. But I still see them. My brain is filling in the details from past experience and from what it knows is there. The mysteries of vision and consciousness are linked. Can mathematics explain the inner world wherein we are aware of mathematical pictures, abstraction, love and poetry? If you take me apart, you will find that I'm made up of, well, ultimately quarks and gluons and electrons. But of course, you would have destroyed me by the act of taking me apart. So I'm very much more than just a collection of quarks, gluons, and electrons, though from the point of view of an elementary particle physicist, which is what I am, that's how I would think about myself. But there's much more to me than that. Just as there's much more to a, a beautiful picture, for example, than just a collection of specks of paint of known chemical composition. We can learn lots of interesting things by taking things apart, but there are many things that we can only learn by looking at things in their wholeness, in their totality. The very phenomenon of consciousness is something like this too that you cannot reduce it to uh, the behavior of a lot of individual units. There's something holistic about the way that it operates. There's something holistic involved in consciousness. Actually, science still has no description of what consciousness is or how it works. There certainly is no mathematical theory of it. Human consciousness is a sort of transcending element of human beings. We're part of the physical world, but we're more than that. Pascal once said that we are thinking reeds. We are just tiny insubstantial things compared to the stars, but we are greater than the stars because we know them and ourselves and they know nothing. So consciousness is pointing us in the direction that there is more to the world than simply the physical world that science describes. And I think if we push that thought further, that leads us to the idea of a divine mind and a divine purpose that is behind all that rich, many-layered experience. There seems to be a very deep union between mathematics and the physical world. Now, as a mathematician, I tend to view mathematics as something which is out there, absolute, independent of ourselves, yet we have access to it with our understanding, our mental abilities. And that again is a mystery, how it is we have somehow access to this world 
this absolute world, timeless world, independent of ourselves, which somehow has been governing the way the physical world operates long before there were any human beings around. As we study the physical world, we see a world of great rational beauty, rational transparency, a world shot through with signs of mind, one might say. And to me, it's a very attractive um, explanation that there is indeed the capital M mind of God the Creator that lies behind that wonderful rational beauty. So you see, when we try to get to the bottom of what reality is, we end up with the mystery of our own minds. What makes us so very special in nature is that we are aware of our own being, our position in time and in space, and that we will die. Every time we study nature, we learn more about our own limitations and how much more we need to know. But while we are alive, we have a consciousness and intellect that can ask fundamental questions about our own existence as well as a passion to uncover the great and profound laws that mould our universe. There may be many forces and many hidden worlds yet to be discovered. That's the challenge to scientists and mathematicians. Perhaps mankind does have a special purpose in the evolution of the universe, where we may be unique and where our role may be only just beginning. Could our quest for total understanding of our brains and the mechanisms of our consciousness allow us into the mind of the master mathematician. I think there's a very deep human desire to understand the world, and I think that's uh, actually a God-given desire, and I think it's one that we should uh, seek to uh, fulfil. Uh, there may be limits to our understanding, but we only find that out by pushing the limits. And it would be deeply satisfying and illuminating, I'm sure, to understand consciousness, um, and even to understand profoundly the nature of mathematics. We want to know what our role in the world is, uh, how we got here, uh, what's going to happen to us after death and things like that. Uh, and so I think that's the same curiosity drives people to religions as, as drives me to science. We have come on a voyage of discovery and exploration a voyage in which we have discovered the power and limits of mathematics to describe reality. My own exploration has left me more and more awed by the intricate interlocking of scientific method, reason and measurement. I am stunned by all we have learned and continue to learn over all these years. But the reasonableness of all these things, these laws of physics that are agreed by us mathematical scientists, does not surprise me, and nor should it you, because our understanding of reality is necessarily self-consistent. Inconsistent, contradictory observations cannot possibly be part of our understanding. That is, the reasonableness of the physical observable universe is a self-evident, automatically true thing, like survival of the fittest. The fascinating thing to me is not that we can make reasonable models of the physical observable universe, but that it is all so beautiful and can seem so to us who are in it and part of it. On our journey, we have seen something of hard mathematical reality, as well as the ephemeral character of the real world. There are logical and scientific limits to our most precise knowledge. Mathematical science, magical and mysterious as it is, is not enough. Boundaries are created by the structure of reason itself, the puzzle of our own consciousness and the unreachableness of infinite precision. There may well be limits to what we can know, but we can only find those limits by pushing up against them. I'm entirely in favour of human beings trying to understand as much as they can about the world. I think they should do so persistently but humbly. And probably the most difficult thing for us to understand is ourselves. I believe that at the heart of our scientific knowledge of reality, there is space for philosophy, free will and God. We are back with the wise men of Greece all those years ago. Much has been learned 
and as much as ever remains unknown, the domain of the heavens.